see that ghost. Hold on. Okay. Peace, peace. We are now live. We are now live. We are now live. This is Brother Rich. Welcome back to another episode. Got a magnificent guest for y'all tonight. As always, I want y'all to get comfortable and uh, hit that like button. That's important. Hit the like button. Get comfortable. We're going to have a great conversation tonight. I got to get to a few commercials and I'll be right back. All right, family? about dream i have dreams too some parts are scary and some parts are fun always remind yourself it's only a dream and everything will be okay i had a dream about being in a forest too check it out my pet pd was with me order your copy of kayla pd and the forest on amazon today it's the Numerovational Session with King Simon. Text your full name and date of birth to 347-496-1022. That's 347-496-1022. And get my books on Amazon now. All right. Without further ado, I want to welcome back to the show, Professor James Small. Welcome back. Living legend. Welcome back, my yes, brother. Sir. It's good to be back, Brother Ritz. Good to be back. Indeed. Hey, Professor Small, you know what a young brother came on here? A young brother named B-Dell came on here. He said, my channel was like the Madison Square Garden of Consciousness. I felt good. I said, woo! He, he, he was close to right. Close I to said, right. woo! I got to... I, I, I love that. I want, I, want to, I want that to be permanent. Shit, man. The hey, Madison it's just, Square Garden of Consciousness. Listen, Professor, it's always a pleasure having you on here, talking with you. You know, uh, we talk often about a disconnection between uh, my 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 generation and your generation, and for us to talk, have this conversation, and have so many people listen, and I love the transparency between both of us. It's just um, it's poetry in motion, my brother. So good to have you back on here. Got an interest. Got an interesting topic for you. I don't I don't know how you're going to respond to it tonight, Professor, but I got a, I got a good topic for you, Professor. I want to get to. I want to show you this word, Professor. Let me uh, put this on the screen. I want to show you this word, good Professor. Hold up. So, disruptor, Professor Disruptor. They say in a dictionary is a company, person, or form of technology that causes significant change in an industry or market by means of innovation, new ideas, or methods. Professor, we're seeing so many disruptors right now, and they've always been around the Marcus Garvey's of the world, the Noble Drew Ali's of the world. But when I tell you things is changing fast, I mean things is changing fast. The school system, the healthcare system, the church, I mean spirituality, I mean, you name it, things are changing, Professor, and people are coming in. Oh, you know what I've seen? I, I'm, let's start out like this. It was real sad to see, and you come from a different generation than me. It was sad to see. Now, this is a traditional institution. A lot of people in my generation don't F with this institution. And the institution I'm talking about is the NAACP. So the NAACP decided to give Gabriel, Gabriel Union and Dwayne Wade a uh, award basically for raising a transgender. Now, that's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. But the way they promote it and the way they they make it seem like it's something honorable. It's something courageous. The boy's mother ain't even proud of this shit. So it's like, and this is the NAACP. What they, it's supposed to be the National Advancement Association of Colored People, I think. But because of we, we, we the name again, National Association, Association the Advancement, the Advancement of, of, color, of Colored, colored people. people. Not colored. African people, not black people, colored people. Colored people. You starting already. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you starting already. So listen, so with that being said, my brother, that's a traditional institution, and a lot of disruptors are here in this world now to kind of get rid of that. I want you to talk to us about how do you feel? You're older than me, my brother. You've been around. You see more than me. 
Uh, mm-hmm. How do you feel about the NAACP doing that and the change and in innovation you're seeing in brothers like Tariq Nasheed with the Hidden History Museum? Billy Carson got an award show coming up that we're doing our own thing. We're not trying to follow them no more. So talk to me about all of that, my brother, to start out with. Well, first, Tariq told me to send his regards. I spoke to him last night to congratulate him. So he said, tell Brother Bridge I'll send my regards and hey, you know, do his thing. Tell him I said, man, big ups. He's doing it big. I seen the pictures. Very yeah. proud of the brother with me. And I seen the mural with you on it, man. You, I seen it, Professor. I seen it. He told me, he said, you got a mural. And I told him, I may change my mind. I ain't going to beat up on you. But that's my <laughs> son. You know, he, he's a son. He's a brother. He's a warrior. He's a changer. He's a disruptor, like you said. Yeah. And um, my thing is just to tell him, as an older brother, you've created a pathway and a light, and the people are looking at you. Don't put cloud around that light. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But the people are looking at you for guidance. When you drop hidden colors out there, it went across the African world. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And so people are saying, this is the brother that has brought us a light. So don't let nobody like that other crazy running around whatever, whatever his name is, throwing dust in the air, blow the dust out your way. Don't even big him up. Don't let him get important on your back, you know. Mm-hmm. But the NACP, first of all, it's, it's, um, was not founded by white people. That's a lying illusion. And the one thing we got to be clear about, especially this generation, mm-hmm. is don't play yourselves. Mm. Okay. The NACP is not a set of letters. It's individuals. We have some poor, piss poor leadership in there right now. Mm -hmm. We have some extraordinary leadership through the years. Mm -hmm. Organization that have done some good work. It's done some bad work, not just now, but it's done some bad work in the past where it's failed us. But most of its work was very good for black people and help our liberation struggle along the way. But Mm -hmm. organizations and methodologies that can become obsolete to the new yeah, turns yeah. in struggle. And you know, one of my teachers, Akin Jobin from Nigeria, said when a culture, an aspect of a culture is no longer useful, you discard it for something better in its place. Mm-hmm. And the NACP, if it has become a relic, see what made it significant in the past, it had a legal arm. Mm-hmm. And it had a magazine that the boys ran, which was a propaganda arm. And for much of the 20th century, that was its power. It had white supporters, but most of its supporters were really black, which is another myth that white people were the one financing it. The biggest financer that the uh, NACP had through most of its history was the Prince Hall Freemason, the black Freemasons. Okay, not the Jews, not the Italians. They were there making it look like they were the big boys. Mm-hmm. Because the black organization that was supported was a society of secret and couldn't say, I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. Right? But mm-hmm. they were doing it. And then the white folks, what they gave was their media outlet, especially mm-hmm. in the 50s. They used their power in media to push our organization forward. But at the same time, they were using it for their interests. See, certain white people didn't have the Southern franchise. They were treated in the South just like black folks. But those cowards didn't want to fight on the front line. So they helped finance organizations like the NACP. So we would fight to change laws that they would take advantage of. Mm-hmm. Everybody know which group I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, the ones that run the music industry and yeah, run yeah, the yeah, yeah. Industry, you know what I'm saying? And we know we don't run it, you know. Mm-hmm. But the NACP was founded by W.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Well, Mary Church Terrell, Booker T. Washington, T. Thomas Force, and I think there were like three white people involved in the founding of the NACP. The bulk of the people who founded the NACP was the same group that founded the Niagara Movement. And that was the same group that founded the Afro-American League in 1892 in Rochester, New York, under the leadership of T. Thomas Fortune. The Afro-American League morphed into the Niagara Movement because they had the big meeting to go over over, um, what they were doing. It says, okay, the way we're approaching this thing, we're not being effective. And so they changed the name of the movement from Afro-American League 
to Niagara movement because they had the big meeting in Niagara. Mm -hmm. And then this is where the trick came in when they hook up with the three white folks, the same group of black people mm -hmm. who were doing the work for black people mm -hmm. all through the late 1800s and um, into the 21st century. We, once you bring white folks into your stuff, you got a problem. But here's what the white folks brought into the NACP. They brought the legal arm. And the NACP was, for much of its existence, the legal arm. That was Thurgood Marshall. All right? He ran the legal arm. But the legal arm was financed by the white folks. So because the political issues they wanted to address and the legal issue they wanted to address was going to give them the play in the South they didn't have. You know how they used to say down South where I grew up, blacks and Jews and dogs stay off of my lawn? Mm -hmm. So you can know who these people was who didn't have the, they were white skinned, but they didn't have the, the, the Southern franchise. Mm -hmm. So they needed the laws changed too. You understand what I'm saying? Right. And so that's why they supported the NACP. But at the same time, trying to manipulate us from having any victories that would be put us in an extraordinary position. So when blacks got the leadership of the NACP, I think in the late or mid 1970s, guess what the white folks did? What? Broke away the legal arm called the Greenberg Legal Center and took the legal part of the NACP away from them. Wow. And that's when the NAC became impotent. It became nothing more than a social advocate because it lost its real teeth, which was what became the Greenberg Law Foundation, Greenberg Law Foundation. That was the legal arm of the NACP that our so-called allies took away because they were financing that piece and obviously put us in a trick in the way they incorporated it. So they were able to incorporate it as the Greenberg Law Foundation. And when we became too black at the top of the NACP, they took it away. Wow. I think the NACP is now trying to build another legal arm of its own, but it was the legal <clears throat> arm of the NACP that was fighting all those different cases. Thurgood Marshall was one of their lead um, lawyers fighting those mm -hmm. cases in the 50s, early 60s. But that, that's the trick. So what we're seeing now, we're seeing a social organization, the biggest thing they do every year is have that little award show where they, they award only people that the system, the white system approve of. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And then they use it because of its historical relationship to black people to push that gay agenda that they were pushing by bringing in a super gay woman like Queen Latifah to host it, right? Mm -hmm. And then she brings in all of her friends and all of her LGBTQ agenda and that got to be pushed. I don't know what any of that had to do with the NACP Image Award. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what, what it was, was using a black medium mm -hmm. that black people have some respect for and pay attention to, to project your social political agenda on our community. And by bringing that basketball player and his wife, and I happen to love his wife as an actress, and their child who probably needs some serious African psychological care, you know, over time, because they weren't taking care of their child like they should have. He was out there being abused by somebody because I had people in my family who was gay, most of them dead from AIDS now, who was in my generation. Every single one of them was raped and molested by some other gay dudes. I had members of my high school class because I couldn't understand it. I came back home from the war and I saw my boys walking my holler with their t-shirt tied up over their belly. I go like, what the hell? Mm -hmm. And when I did get Sammy and Arnold to talk to me, what happened? We all went to school together. How come I didn't see this? Then I found out about Mr. Brown, the band teacher. I found mm -hmm. out Mr. Brown, the phys ed teacher. And I wonder why they all used to hang out with my used to feel left out. Damn, I'm glad I was left out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I felt left out because they'd be going over to the teachers' houses. They got invited to little parties, but I lived in the country, you know? Yeah. And I didn't get invited, but I thought they were being privileged. No, they were being fed marijuana and fed other drug use and being misused as young 
teenagers and pulling in to this way of life. Yeah. And telling people something about some God made made them God don't make no mistakes, stupid. The universe is God. The universe don't make mistakes. You made some choices based on a cultural imperative that was born in Europe. We saw it manifest in its biggest practice in Rome and Greece, or Greece and Rome. And now it's been renewed in the 21st century as a weapon against black people. But anyway, mm. let's not give that more attention than it yeah. deserves. We've, we've given it what it deserves. Let it go where it belongs in the garbage bin. I guess, well, let me continue uh, like this. You know, we started out, we talked about a traditional institution like the NAACP. We talk about this concept of uh, what they're well, calling. Let me just if yeah. it does what I saw the other night, and that is its direction, it needs to be thrown in the garbage heap of history and burned. Mm. Mm. You know? You know, you know it, what I was, you know what was I was. An attack dog against black people the other night. That's all I saw. An mm. attack dog against black people's progress. Wow. So let me ask you this question. I don't think people ask them. Where was white gay America doing slavery? For nearly 400 years, where was the white gay American movement? Were, weren't they the same in slavery? According where to the white <laughs> woman feminists, were they not the wife of the same enslavers? Weren't they the ones telling their husband how to kill us so they can get a better hoop dress and some more porcelain from China? And all of a sudden now that we trying to find some space in some way, they're running out and say, yo, we white woman, we're in the same boat as you. No, you're not. You were in the boat as my oppressor for hundreds of years committing genocide against me. You and your gay family counterpart. Let history tell me where you were doing 400 plus years of genocide against the African population. Tell me where you were. Mm. And now you want to ride on my back to set up your new empire of mm. Greece and Rome. And then gonna try to convince me that there's something in Africa that support this or that the universe is, is warped and wrong. And everything I've ever believed about God and everything I've ever learned from my ancestors and everything I ever learned about my culture is wrong because you now gonna come with a vessel from my murderer and my genocider and my enslavers and say they got the right path for my future. Mm -hmm. I hope we haven't gotten that insane yet. But see, the young people got this thing. Mm -hmm. One thing I have faith in is your generation, you know, because y'all don't play that woke game. Because we're not woke. <laughs> we are. Mm -hmm. We are the living human being. Any of the other mutants and their mutated cultural variation and versions of self, let's put it in the context of belonging, mutations. Social mutations, cultural mutations, ethical, moral mutations live with the genetic mutations. And that's what's being imposed upon us. So what, what was that word you defined? Uh, disruptor. Yeah, so we got to be some hellified disruptors mm. so we can get it right. Well, let me ask you this, Professor. Um, do you think sometimes we throw are too quick to throw? And somebody said, I, I put on the screen, somebody said, wow, never heard that angle. This is why I need brothers your age. You've seen much more than I've seen in this world in the last 100 years. And there's things you said I did not know and I did not read in books. So I want to thank you before I continue for speaking your wisdom to us and teaching us through your experience, my brother. Uh, do you? My generation is too quick to throw out the baby with the bathwater. And I use that example. We could think about the church. We could think about mm -hmm. other institutions, school. Nobody want to mess with school. Them niggas like school ain't, you know, I ain't school ain't worth, you know, what, what do you think about that? Do we, are we too well, quick I to? Well, I think that's foolish at its worst. And I understand it for what it is. Mm -hmm. When you see something hurting you, it, you want to get away from the pain. Mm -hmm. And so, but the reason it's hurting you is because you haven't taken the effort to take control of it, so that it won't hurt you. We invented schooling. White people didn't invent no schooling. We've stolen legacy. 
the entire education system of the West is already in Kemet before the West even come out of the caves. Now he got control of it and misusing the system against us. But we need to create our own system. And that's kind of like what you're doing. What we're doing now is a classroom. Mm -hmm. We are educating our people. And we're trying our best to bring it as authentic as we can and make sure we can back stuff up. Because I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I got 14 books stacked up here. That I'm, before we are, we're going to get a glimpse of all of them. Let them know we got back, right? Mm -hmm. From other Black scholars mm -hmm. across history who believe and feel as we do and wrote it down. And these guys all had PhDs, just like the crazies we're seeing out here. Mm -hmm. The NACP was a very useful tool for its time. But remember, it is not a name. It is the persons who are managing it. If those persons who are managing it is not managing it appropriately, and we can't change the persons, then we need to disassociate from the organization. It's as simple as that. If it doesn't serve us, and especially when it makes us an aggressive anti-African spirituality that I saw the other night, anti-African sacred science that I saw the other night, anti-African culture with no respect mm. going to take the, 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 the experiences of Black people who were in a genocide process of daily death and rape, pillage, and plunder for 400 years and tried to pair it beside some white, confused, gender-confused behavior. The same white people who worked to commit the genocide, now they want to come up with another way to keep us from breaking free. So they come up with another way to entrap us. Tell me where nature has gone wrong. And I'll show you the behavior that you are calling nature that has gone wrong. I don't feel any anger or hate for my brother and sister, especially for the baby. I feel like black people need to wake up and study their culture. Like you said, we throw out the baby with the bathwater, meaning the younger generation. I think they do a lot of that because a lot of them are not studying deep enough. Okay. You've got to learn the history. How many people have put down Booker T. Washington in favor of Marcus Garvey? Which is a foolish dichotomy because the two men were the best of friends. Booker T. Washington invites Mr. Garvey to come here. Mr. Garvey came here to further Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee model and program. If you don't know that history, then you think somehow Booker is opposed to Garvey. Or Garvey is opposed, or Booker is opposed to immigrants from other African places coming here. It was Booker T. Washington that fought the African Exclusion Act that the Congress was trying to put through so no Blacks from the Caribbean or Africa could migrate to the United States. Booker T. Washington fought that fight and defeated the bill in Congress. Do we know that history? History will erase the mystery. And you can make a proper analysis of who to listen to and who not to listen to. We hear another one about the boys and Booker being enemy because they had the differences over um, strategy. I hear a lot of bad thing about W.E.B. The boys. Yeah, but tell, if I told you to point me out one bad thing, well, put your book on the table. Put your put your proof on the table. Most people can't do it because they can't find none. Mm. W.B. had a tip with Garvey, and they had a nasty exchange mm. because Garvey had a meeting with the Klan. The Klan is our traditional genocider. Garvey is our brother from abroad. How do you come dare come in my house and meet with my perpetual murderer and genocider without some discussion with those of us who've been in the struggle before you got here? But the, 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 the nastiness of the letters, I disagree with. But the principles of it, God, man, the boys is absolutely right. Okay? Mm -hmm. But we need to study and look at these things and get it right. Because a lot of the way we are looking at history, them same other folks that have been directing the NACP, those mm -hmm. are the same folks that was directing how we look at radical black history over the last 40 years. You're right. Yeah. Our so-called left-wing friends <laughs> writing our history or backing and financing the black Marxists who was writing our history. 
about our radical behavior. Well, uh, you know, but yeah, yeah. Professor. you know, Professor, you said our so-called leftist liberal friends. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's changing, that this generation is changing, that your generation, and this is where you may disagree, your generation fought. I don't want. I don't want to misterm it, but you could say the previous generations fought for the right to vote. This generation feel as though they're not buying the uh, lesser of two evils saying. You know, well, we got to pick the lesser of two evils. It's kind we of different now. We, it's we kind never of different fought now. for the lesser of two evils. See, but the mistake you just made. Mm -hmm. You said your generation fought for the rights of the vote, and then you equate that with the lesser of two evils. That you can't do that. No, no, I'm not equating that. I'm not equating that with it, but that's just a popular no, saying within our punk, culture. You tell your you generation something. You're punking out mm -hmm. if you don't take control of the voting franchise where you live. You're punking out, okay? Because whether you vote or not, somebody's going to hold the office that determine who you, what your law is going to be, that determine what your prison sentence is going to be, that determines when your garbage gets picked up, that determine who your police is going to be, that determine when your street gets clean. Okay, and on and on. That's what elected officials are supposed to do. Now, some mm -hmm. of the bums that we are putting in there mm -hmm. ain't doing that. And I agree with the young people. But my thing is, get their butts up. Vote them out and put one of you young brothers up in there or young sisters up in there that will go with the agenda that you want. Don't put some old head in there because they seem to know what's going on politically better than you. Start studying the system so you know how it works better than they do. Professor, it's not about a tool. Professor, why do you think the Democrats have been so successful? You know, these white liberal, these leftist liberal friends that you refer to at brainwashing us. They're very, they have been extremely successful. Extremely. Because they've been extremely successful, but blacks have only been Democrats since the since. turn of the 20s, 20, really after the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Before that, blacks was Republicans. Mm -hmm. And then there was a move, just like you see the move now to try and get the um, Latino votes by letting 12 million people in the country, they come up with some dreamer shit, and then we're going to make them all citizens, and they can come in the country, and no disrespect to my Latino brothers and sisters across that border, they need help, let's help them. We should be at the border giving out things to help them too. But we're allowing the enemy to use them, and then we get mad with them because they got used. Mm. You know? But the enemy is very clear. You got two groups of white people fighting each other, right? Mm -hmm. One group is controlling the party you call the Republicans. That's the crazy right wing ones who got this false concept about their superiority. Mm -hmm. Half of them are on welfare, right? Most half of them are on food stamps, right? While denying anybody else access to food stamps. You know, just so that's simple. If you look and see, who are the major population of welfare over the last 50 years? It's white Americans. Who are getting the most food stamp over the last 50 years? It's white Americans. All right? Who's getting the most financial assistance from the government? It's white farmers in, in the form of farm subsidy. That's welfare. All right? Billions upon billions of dollars every year. Right? So here's the biggest welfare pimps in the country calling themselves white supremacists. Okay? And we need to be wake up. That's why we got to study, man. We got to read and we got to dig into this thing. And we got a lot of technical tools now with this telephone and the Google and stuff. We can hit libraries that I couldn't hit in my time. Y'all can get information I couldn't get in my time. We got Freedom of Information Act and we can get information that I couldn't get in my time. But we got to do that work. Voting ain't voting for the Democrats. You can vote for who the hell you want. You can vote for a fly. In the last election, I voted for my granddaughter. Ooh. I wrote her in as the president of the United States. She's saying, well, I don't want to be no president. I said, baby, I'm making you the president of the United States. And I went in the voting booth where I always take my grandchildren with me so they could see. And I voted for my granddaughter for president of the United States. Now, she only got one vote from grandpa, but that was my point. Because <clears throat> I wasn't voting for none of the filth that was masquerading as political leadership. But we shouldn't have to vote for the filth. We should learn the system, your generation. We've created a system for you. Now you're saying we created it stupidly? No, learn the system. Take the responsibility to know how politics work. Take the responsibility to know how to run somebody from office. 
take the responsibility how to take an idea and bring it to a law. Yes, sir. You can do that. I can mm -hmm. help teach you that kind of stuff. There are mm -hmm. others who can help teach your generation that. I will refer you to books where you can find that information. And then you take the machinery away from the criminal Democrats and the criminal Republicans, and you run your generation for office. But you got to learn how the thing works. It's like any other game. Or just leave the game. You can all go to Africa, find a farm in the bush somewhere <laughs> and pull out. You know? But that ain't going to work for too long because they're coming in the bush to get your farm from you. So you better be ready to handle it. I say okay. handle it where you are. Like Booker says, put your buckets down where you are. I'm going to fight right here. Draw the line. Mm. Step across that line, your ass is mine. Mm -hmm. you know, we have to learn how the system works because somebody is deciding everything of your life. Somebody is deciding how many garbage pickups you have. Somebody is deciding what the housing bills, what kind of aid you're going to get for housing. Someone is deciding um, what kind of subsidy you're going to get for rent, low income. Those, those somebody, so those people who get elected whether you vote for them or not. They're controlling the apparatus that controls your life. So if you want to control that apparatus, we've given you the right to vote, but now you have to learn how to use that vote because we couldn't give you that. You give yourself that because you got the tool. It's like I handed you a loaded gun. Mm -hmm. You set it on the table and said, I ain't going to shoot nobody. Mm -hmm. And there's 10,000 dudes coming at you with guns. You know what I'm saying? You better yeah. like use that gun like real quick. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we've been misled and misused and abused even by black folks with the voting franchise. And that's why this young generation got a study and said, listen, color the skin ain't enough for you to say you're leading me anywhere. Okay? Your behavior, your character, let me see some, I need to see some paper trail on what you did for black people, or at least what you tried to do. But instead of going to the next generation, it's your generation time, but you got to learn and master the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How to use the tool. Indeed. You know? What do you think, Professor, about, you know, obviously we live in a, we live in a, uh, the world is so different today than it was in 1970, 1960, and right. the 50s. Um, a lot of, your generation and a lot of the previous generations with the, I know you, you, you're a part of several spiritual systems, right? Ifa mm -hmm. and, you know, st different things. The younger generations don't feel as though they have to be initiated into systems to gain a certain level of spirituality or to have obtained a certain uh, level of wisdom. Um, I guess I, I guess in the past people felt as though they had to join places or be no, initiated. That's not the way we felt. What's, I, it's, I, I, it's about yeah. organization. Mm -hmm. You can't have ten thousand people giving you ten thousand ways on how the sun hit the earth, mm -hmm. unless you're going to organize those ten thousand ways and see that they are all irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Most all initiation mean is that you agree to be a part of a process. That's all initiation is. Somebody mm -hmm. puts you through a ceremony. And we all agree that we're going to move together on these concepts, ideas, and principles. Mm. There's nothing spooky about it. People have made it spooky. It's just an agreement between men and women that we're going to use these sets of rules and these sets of principles to try and achieve our goals, which is fundamentally food, clothing, shelter, safety for ourselves being determined by ourselves. Mm. Okay? Mm. That's really bottom line. Now, if we keep forgetting that, you can... Be as spiritual as you want to be. Ain't a damn thing more gonna happen that's happening. Okay. Because mm -hmm. spirituality is fundamentally you being in control of your reality and understanding why and how you are. Right, right. Now let me say that again, because see, people miss that. Spirituality mm -hmm. is your reality when you're in control of that reality and you're conscious, fundamentally conscious of how you are. There ain't nothing spooky and mystical. You ain't going to float up off the ground if you chant or sing or dance a certain number or nothing like that or wear a certain kind of clothing. People who are in the traditional spiritual systems wear a certain kind of clothing as a way of identifying with our ancestral past. Mm -hmm. But most people don't, who wear a uh, booba or that shit, if you don't wear this every day, this weather won't even allow for it. You wear what's appropriate for the climate you're in. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
but when you're doing a ceremony, you want to symbolically reach back to the ancestors. Say, I respect you. I respect your wisdom. My job is to add to the wisdom. Mm-hmm. But I can't add to something I don't know. I can't say I'm I'm learning spirituality and I have no historical foundation or grounding for it. What am I learning? Is that European craziality? What is African spirituality? What is it rooted in? Where is the historical foundation for it? What is the science behind it? What is our understanding of nature? African spirituality is a study of the of nature and the wisdom derived from that study. It is the study of cosmology and the wisdom derived from the study of cosmology. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the application, the appropriate application of the body of knowledge that you gain understanding of from the study of nature and cosmology. And you have to put it in some kind of framework and order so that you can protect your body of wisdom and that you can teach it sequentially because you can't get the level 10 if you haven't mastered the first nine. What what kind of organization is that going to be? You know, so, but to bring it back to simplicity, Mm -hmm. many of the brothers and sisters who are out here saying they're in traditional African religion, they they just run in Judeo-Christian crap and blackface. They're using Yoruba terms, but they're acting no better and they're teaching no better than the Judeo-Christian who teach in their fairy tales, fantasy, and mythology that's not rooted and based in no scientific knowledge of any kind. The African system is science. Actually, what the white man calls science is really your spiritual system Uh that he stole from you. Uh So, yes, everybody has a spiritual reality. Everybody. Whether they ever heard the word or not. How do you cultivate that so the person becomes a healthy spiritual being in their understanding of their spiritual essence? That's all systems are about. Systems is relationship between different parts that function in some harmonious way for the benefit of the whole. Some people have used these concepts called religions to enslave and imprison others. That's why I love the African system. In the African system, there is no priesthood. This thing of African priests and stuff, even I've used the term and I've stopped using, is a lie, right? Africans respect eldership, but this concept of priests, the way we look at it is all wrong. The people we're calling priests, they're really the scientists and the specialists in particular aspect of understanding cosmology and ecology. Now, what ceremony they put around, it depends on what the people agree to. Because ceremonies and stuff, dance and music and drumming, that is to keep you focused and keep you in memory of what it is you're supposed to be and be doing. You know, it's just another way to recall stuff. But nobody teaches that. Nobody's explaining. They got people out there jumping around dancing and we getting busy looking at the sister's legs and the short skirts. We don't ask what the, what the, what the footstep means. Right. What does the hand movement mean? Mm-hmm. What story are they telling? What mm-hmm. message is that dance giving? You know, they look so sexy and fine. We ain't thinking about nothing else except that. Mm-hmm. And don't realize that every one of those dances comes out of a cultural experience and culture is how people educate themselves. And it carries messages explaining to that particular culture some concept, ideas, and principle that they need to grasp and remember. Now, we may need to teach some new dances to your generation. But now we came with the hip-hop thing, and we thought that anything foolishly that we did was cool. We're calling it culture. That, That ain't culture. That's an aspect of American culture going wild from the Black community. Let's break it down. What was the message? And in the message, was there a method? What was the method in the message? So we can then retain it. Of course, hip hop is an extraordinary phenomenon. Black youth produce a way of having a conversation, right? About the social commentary and the social contradiction 
explaining their oppression, but then they allow the white man to take it over and turn it in on themselves and start using it to teach the mind of the black youth how to destroy themselves for a fistful of dollars. So let's flip that back. It's still your mind, like Stephen Biko said, the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Get the mind back. <clears throat> See that thing we saw in the NACP the other night? They were playing on our minds. Using their medium, their big media, their TV. Reaching millions of people. Using stars, people we look up to and revere to carry a message of our destruction. Okay, we got control of this medium here now, right? We got control of social media. We can reach as much people as they can. But we got to get, like get the message right. That's facts. Get the message right. This generation is the finest generation ever produced. But if you don't get the message right, it's going to have to wait for the next generation. You get busy killing your mama and your daddy and go tell me there's some kind of sense in that. Killing your ancestors, there's some kind of sense in that. They ain't know where that makes any sense to anybody that got any sense. Now, you still might say, I don't understand what the ancestors was doing. Well, I don't like some of the things that they did and I want to correct them. Okay, that's a different approach. Because ancestors screwed up too, right? Because they had to work with what? The information they had. Sometimes they got some of it right. Sometimes they didn't get it right. But you got to study that. I said, what did they get right? And what they didn't get right. So we could throw that out. But you don't condemn your ancestors. You look at the group in this country, the European groups. That's the most powerful and the richest in this country. They got more holidays than Carter got little liver pills. And every one of those holidays is about an ancestral experience. They love their ancestors. Uh They praise their ancestors. They honor their ancestors. They study from their ancestors. Then they got our generations condemning their ancestors. Well, where do you think you come from? An anthill? You came out of the vagina of the people you're condemning. And if you came out of that vagina, guess what you are? You are they. Uh The only thing your mom and daddy could have made you with was themselves. Uh And the only thing they were made up of was your grandparents. And the only thing they were made up of was your great grandparents. (coughs) Who is it that you're condemning? What we need to do is study the ancestors and see what did they get right? What did they get wrong? What could we use from what they've done in the past? And what must we discard? That's the track we've got to go. Because you're the most well-educated generation we've had. You're the most technically trained generation we've had. You're the freest generation. Mm. Because you freed yourself from white mental domination in a greater way than any other generation has since we got caught up in this enslavement business. Mm. But you can't let them trap you into rejecting yourself. Your mama is you, man. Your daddy is you. That's yourself Mm. at another time. Talk to him, professor. Come on, Mm. man. Come on. So that's the piece we have to get. Come on, Professor. I am right now. I got six kids. That's Mm. me tomorrow. That's my tomorrow. Yes, sir. I'm there yesterday. Not not figuratively speaking. I'm actually them. For real, for real, for real. I'm actually them. Right now, when I pull my patient, I'm pointing to my damn self. I am the ancestors. That's African sacred science. We got to understand it right, though. <clears throat> we can't bring the Christian, Judeo-Islamic motif to looking at African things. The reason your generation is so powerful is because of what our generation did. Otherwise, your ass will still be back to doing the jigaboo. Okay? Because of what we did, you on another plateau that we can't even get to. You know, it's like the story, even, and you got to get it. Most of those stories in the Bible, Torah, Quran, are our stories. But somebody else took it and planted it in their culture. Yeah. yeah. And regurgitated up from their cultural space. Yeah. The reason Moses can't go to the promised land, because that's the next generation space. <laughs> I can't go to your promised land. That's your space. Okay. You know, you're going to get to the mountaintop, not me. Yes. But I showed you the trail up the mountain. Yeah. And so just respect me for that. 
Indeed. Let me, let me go on about my business. And hey, you go do your business. Hey, and speaking of, show you some respect for that. Before we continue, let me put the professor's um, cash app information on the screen. That's always <laughs> good. That's <laughs> you know, for those who want to support the professor for making a way for brothers like myself and uh, the other brothers you see on the channel, the younger brothers, the professor's cash app, dollar sign Dr. James Small. Also, the professor's PayPal right there, csmall1926 at aol.com. And it is very important that we support our elders and, uh, you know, show them that we appreciate what they have done for us. You know, uh, you stand on my back. When you say be standing on somebody's shoulders, that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. And if you're standing on my shoulder, ain't you taller than me? Because you're supposed to be taller than me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm standing on somebody's shoulder. I'm like one step on the ladder. My, the generation Dr. Clark and Dr. Ben and them before me, there's another step on the ladder. I'm standing on the step that they were on. Yeah. You now stand on the step that I was on. Mm -hmm. And when you get to be the eldest, your kids are going to be standing on the step. So they're going to get taller with each generation. Mm -hmm. But if you saw the steps that we are off, your ass could back to the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And you got to start all over again. You don't yeah. have to start all over again. We've left you something. Mm -hmm. Take the best of what we gave you, throw the rest in the garbage, and keep it moving. It's simple. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this, Professor. What do you think about? Um, I want to talk to you about a you know a topic. Uh, the the institution of marriage. It's not black marriage is down, and we don't value marriage as much as the previous generations and. I somewhat understand it. I can understand both perspectives if you want to agree or disagree. Somebody mm -hmm. said, just sent Professor Small 100. I appreciate it, my brother. I appreciate it, my brother or sister. Yes, that is, sir. Yeah, that's very you. much appreciated. Blessings to you. Blessings yeah. to you. Yeah, that is very much Look, appreciated. You know, I think marriage but, is important. I've it, been married. But the institution in America I'm, refer I'm referring to. But, but see, we got to be careful, though. Mm -hmm. We can't let white America define us. Woo. It recreated marriage in Africa as a way of organizing ourselves to take responsibility for the lives we're bringing in the world. And then taking responsibility for one another. Now we over here, where somebody has no value on anything, we talk about our divorce rate, his divorce rate is just as high, okay? His marriage is falling apart because of his behavior, Ours is falling apart because of his behavior. He runs the country. He runs the culture. He controls the socialization process. Now, here's what the socialization process is. That's how you get your values. That's how you get your interests. That's how you get your principles. So if somebody else is controlling how you get your values, your interests, and principles, and that same person is determining if someone gets married and a man and a woman, because that's the only kind of marriage that's really marriage in the African sense of marriage. When a male and a female get married for the purpose of recreating themselves, but then being able to take care of what they create so it is not destroyed by others. And so family allows you to, marriage allows you to build a family to protect the new creations of you that we call your offspring, okay? But then they gotta be principles that you agree to in order to keep harmony and balance and safety in that, in that family unit. And marriage is one of those organizational constructs that allows you to do that. I'm lucky and you're lucky that we have any kind of marriage given what we've gone through in America. Hmm. If somebody kept us from even marrying one another in any formal way for almost 270 years daily. Here's somebody that treated us like such animals. They come and rape the woman next to you while you chained to a pole in the same room. And when you protest, they'll either kill you, kill your woman, or kill the baby. And that didn't go on for one day, one year, 10 years. That went on for nearly three hundred years mm. and we still came out of all of that healthy enough 
to try and reconstruct the black family. If you look at the records on Juneteenth, after that General Gerber, Gordon, whatever his name is, read his little proclamation. First thing the cracker put in the proclamation, people talk about Juneteenth and, and General whatever his name is, they ain't worth being calling. You know what the thing says? What? You cannot leave the plantation you're on. You cannot go looking for your family. You cannot go hunting for your children or your wife or your husband. That's what the cracker put in his order. Wow. You freeing me for telling me I ain't free. Right. You know what the first thing black folks did though, right? They ran off to look for their wives, their husbands, and their children that had been taken away from them because the African sense of family overrode even the American military. Mm. Or the order from the presidents of the United States because we invented that institution because it's a spiritual bond. It ain't just some legal arrangement. With him, it's a legal arrangement. He treats his wife like a dog most of the times anyway. That's their culture. I didn't do this to their culture, and I'm not defaming them. I'm talking about, let's look at historically, if you the one, I'll break out some books and show you, you know, on how they treated women. Look at the Inquisition in Spain. Mm. And then I got a book here on, on the woman, the history of women in Europe. <laughs> then I got a book called Dirt, about the history of white folks in Europe. Look at how they treated their women. And we wonder why they did what they did to ours. Now, are we going to say that the result of his genocide, which has led to this destruction and dissolution of the family system and structure, with marriage being one of the things we saw them taking aim at, and we saw that clearly on the NACP the other night. Yes, that's part of it. You got to destroy the Black family if you're going to defeat the Black family. They've come at it first trying to draw and destroy the black man. That gave us a good one, but then that black woman kept holding on. Now they're after the black woman and the black man. Because they understand that if they don't destroy them both, they can't destroy the black family. And in order to destroy black dominance on the planet, they got to destroy the black family. Because you see, black, my brother put it up, my sister, sister put it up. Thank you, Sarah. Dirt is a classical Euro exposed on the dirt. There it is. You've read the book, then. It's Dr. Clark turned me on to that book. So you can you can Google it. It's a real book. It tell you how these people treated each other. And look at the Inquisition. Who would put a chastity belt on their woman? Mm. Who in the world would make a metal drawers with a lock on it and leave that woman in it for one to two years? How did she clean herself, for God's sake? And you telling me that that that's human and logical? Well, this is the mind that was running the plantations, practicing the genocide on, on us in America for 200 years and have fragmented and broken us. So our marriage concept is fragmented and broken. Our family concept is fragmented and broken. That's why we need to study our history and get rid of his mystery and his lies so we can find out how to reconstruct ourselves so that we back in harmony with the universe itself again. Dr. Hilliard said true freedom is to be shackled to your identity. What is our identity? You think it's some accident that we arguing about? I'm a Moor, I'm a Hebrew, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Christian, I'm a Baptist, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, I'm a Jehovah Witness, I'm an African, I'm an African-American. I'm a foundation of black America. You think with all this fragmentation, you think he ain't in there playing some games? <laughs> this fragmentation, you know who I am? We use the term to define it because the African University have accepted that term African. I am the friggin' universe. You look at any African language and let them describe their divinity. They describe their divinity as the totality of creation itself. <clears throat> they and they define themselves as an expression of an aspect of the essence of that divinity. So I am the universe. Now, can the mutation of me be the universe? Mm -mm. It can only be a particle in the universe that can irritate and antagonize me to keep me wanting to be the universe. <laughs> I hope people got that one. Wow, man. That's that's something. <laughs> you son tonight, Professor. You son tonight, man. Mm -hmm. You son tonight. Let me but tell them, I want to tell my babies, you know, y'all my babies, right? Y'all are the best babies 
we've ever produced. You don't have to fight me because I love you. We've done the best we could. Now you got to take it the next step, but don't throw the good that I've done out with the mistakes I've made. Mm-hmm. Throw out the mistakes and keep the good. Keep the good. And keep it moving. So that when your generation come, they don't look down on you. Because if you look down on your ancestors, you look down on yourself. If you can't love your ancestors, you can't love yourself. It's impossible because you and the ancestors are the same self at just a different time in history. When you get that part right, you free. Indeed. Powerful, powerful episode tonight, Elder. Powerful episode tonight. I definitely appreciate the wisdom. I want to get to some Q&A from the people. Uh, before I do, uh, one last question for me, my brother. Um, you know, we have le- we, we talked about this term disruptor. And one of the I'm things. That, oh, yeah, you are. I agree with you. I like that term. I remember earlier today I was <laughs> kind of scratching on it. <clears throat> when my wife was driving, but I said, you know what? That brother got it right. <laughs> you well, know, we but, need to all become disruptors. Professor, as a as a disruptor, as a leader, you know what's strange? Sometimes, you know, you may know you have to go against the system, but sometimes, Professor, you may have to go against somebody like your mentor or somebody like the person who taught you everything, your teacher, your, you know, whatever. Talk to the people out there, the leaders of the world. That may, that, that'll throw you off when it first happens, and it may confuse a lot of people if you mm-hmm. have to go against your own mentor. Can you talk to us about the psychology of that? Yeah. Well, How the to, thing is, you don't go... You not against... Of- it's not yeah. against but yeah remember i said you got to use the language right yeah yeah, yeah. we don't want to bring the european concept mm-hmm. to a decision and a process we have to make mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and what you have to do like the other day on saturday for the mm-hmm. young people who know the og right and i'm mm-hmm. the og right <laughs> i was receiving my 10th degree red belt from my dojo mm. and and the beautiful thing I know I don't, I haven't quite earned that 10th degree red belt yet, Mm -hmm. but I want everybody to know OG goes to karate class every Saturday Mm. on Sensei Mo. And we studied, you know, we studied the 52 block system and I've been in and out of the dojo since 1967. I got to get him on the show, professor. Oh yeah. You got to bring him Mo. Mo's a bad dude. You know Mo? You got to connect me with him. Oh, I'll hook you up. (laughs) You got to Sensei Mo. He used to be my student at college. I gave him his oh. first place to do his first dojo. Wow. Okay. Okay. That's back in the day when Wesley Snipes was hanging out and studying with us as yeah. a youngster learning the system. Mm-hmm. But what the beautiful thing was about 60 of the masters showed up to pay mm-hmm. respect to my son. I'm sitting there like crying. When I say masters, other brothers, 80, 85, Sam mm-hmm. McGee was there. Brother Abdul, 80 years old, looking better than me and you. <laughs> They're still running the dojo. I'm looking around the room and all these red belts around the room honoring me because I stuck with them all these years. They consider me to be the historian, you know, on the martial arts. And I teach how the arts come out of ancient Africa, come out of ancient Kibbutz, move into ancient India, move from Indo- India into the Himalayas, and move from the Himalayas into the rest of Asia. That's the story of the arts. And then we talk about, you can see that all of the movements on the walls of the tombs in Kemet. So when we understand truth, we know that that truth belonged to us. And so we got to respect that truth. But everything changes. So coming back to how do you talk about going against your teachers, your mentors, Many of my teachers who were there the other night and mentors, I had to take a kind of different path because I was younger and I had some new information they didn't have. But I didn't go against them. I learned what they taught me. And then I took that to another level. I respect what they taught me, but I had to go beyond those boundaries. You understand? Because there's new knowledge that allows me to ascend to a level that their knowledge did not allow them to ascend. Were they initially upset at you for going that direction? A few, but most of them always support it because I always respect them. Okay. And let them know I respect you. 
because mm. I was with Malcolm X's sister. Mm. But we had differences of opinion on where to go with the movement. Malcolm had been killed working in an overt organization open to the public. And we saw how infiltrated it was that the cops was all over him. And I wanted to run a clandestine operation and did it so well. How many people know that I'm the man who succeeded Malcolm X as the imam of the Muslim mosque? Nearly no one knows that. How many knew I was in Mecca before most of your generation was born? Nearly no one knows that. Because I felt that if that openness and before the pressness got our leader killed, then we need to switch course here. And I ain't looking for no fame. <laughs> like, let me go and learn what is it he was trying to tell us. And what Malcolm was trying to tell us is so simple. Your responsibility is to provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for yourself and your family. You can't do that unless you take control of economic, politics, and culture where you live. You can't sustain that unless you take control of land, labor, and resources. You can't do that unless you use the vote to take control of the political system that runs where you are. And you can't do that if you don't raise your consciousness to a higher Black level, to understand the history that brought you to where you're at, so you can create new dynamics and a new history to take you where you have to go. And it comes in steps. You're not gonna learn all of that one time, but we've got to learn it in steps. But we got to be clear on what the goal is. In order for you to do all of that, family structuring is an organizational model that is proven workable. Just look at those people who are successful. They're, they're screwing up your family, but they bonding their families, right? You see them all go to their neighborhoods. They're walking in groups every Friday, right? Every Saturday, the whole family, but they're telling you that family is dead because they understand that is one of the smallest unit at the foundation of civilization. Now, the smallest of all the units at the foundation of civilization is the individual with cosmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I'm using the word cosmic deliberately because African co culture is based on cosmology at its foundation. Mm -hmm. so cosmic consciousness ain't no mythology. That is an understanding of all that is. Mm -hmm. And so once that individual raises its consciousness, it, it looks for a mate of the opposite sex that is in an equal consciousness, or at least on the pathway to raising their consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then you bond and create a greater consciousness. And when you give offspring, then you train that offspring to expand that consciousness. So that when that offspring then bond with another group who had mate from a group who's got that consciousness, you then took your little nuclear family and expanded expand to that it. extended family. Mm -hmm. But it's organized mm -hmm. around ideas, principles, and concepts that you hold sacred. Now you make music to enforce these ideas. You make music to teach you and dance to teach you to remember these ideas and to inculcate it and ingrain it in you. And we call that culture. But those things are tools of the culture. It is the ideas that is the culture. The ideas is what is the culture. Dancing, singing, mu music, th those are tools of the culture. Drama, theater, movies, those are cool tools of the culture. The culture is the ideas you're trying to convey. What is the idea the music is talking about? What is the idea the dance is talking about? What is the idea the movie is talking about? What is the idea the documentary is talking about? What is the idea the book is talking about? Those are tools of culture. Culture is the idea that governs your behavior as a human being. And that is what they don't want you to get organized enough to come back to because Africa had it right. We just got whipped. They kicked our behinds, okay? They came in there on a war footing. We were out there in the field planting and, and, and fishing because we weren't into a war culture. They came out of a death culture. We were into a life culture. But we had to try to convert and get into the death culture in order to defend ourselves. But we never really was able to get into the death culture because that's not our thing. 
And so it was so easy for him to turn the little we learn about the death culture on ourselves. Mm -hmm. But if we study our culture, study the ancestors, learn the best you can from them, you youngster will learn how to reconstruct yourself and now you know how to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Indeed. You, you got to protect that sacred temple you reconstruct. Indeed, indeed, Professor. Let's get to a few, a uh, couple of questions before we get out of here. I'm going to take about two questions from the family before we get out of here. Let me share the professor's info. If you're interested in donating as well as I'm going to share the kept my cash app. Uh, if you want to donate to the channel, you are more than you welcome. Can definitely support this channel. People love this channel in the world, brother. I'll tell you. <laughs> you I, I'd be surprised. I mean, my age group is the one that I know. That's, That's who up. loves you. Uncle Lebron, how y'all love a rich? <laughs> my age group loved black magic. That's, That's the great black magic. Yeah, yeah. They, they call you black magic. You want <laughs> black magic. I didn't know what you were talking about at first. I know brother Rich, but my age group love you. It's an honor. It's an honor. It's an honor, Professor. I'd like to show some books, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's see some books. Let me show y'all. You know, we're talking about the disruptor. Yes. W.B. Du Bois was a disruptor, right? Don't take the enemy's story about him. Study the man for yourself. He wasn't the punk they try to make you think <laughs> mm -hmm. right? or was. And he still is because he's a spirit being, you know, now. And he was a God being then having a human experience. Frederick Douglass, whoa, this brother will blow your mind, right? This brother here went back to Africa and tried to get all of us back to Africa long before the birth of the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Went back to Nigeria to a place called Abiy Okuta, mm -hmm. where his grandfather was from. And then the master himself of back to Africa, who comes later and learns from the youngsters, the Honorable Marcus Garvey. Study him for yourself. Don't just have a terminology. We got the books. We got the literature to tell the story. Then learn this story. How the North, these are liberal friends, right? Learn about how the North promoted and prolonged slavery. Mm. The ones who said they were trying to free us, right? Let me try to get that in there so you can see the yeah, book. Let me make it bigger. Yeah. yeah. Learn how they prolonged slavery and how they financed slavery while at the same time pretending to be fighting against it. And the book is fantastic. You know, it's called Complicity. Then, of course, you want to get the Amos Wilson, the master yes. teacher, the blueprint uh -huh. to black power. And these kind of, because people think like we didn't leave the, no, our generation, we left you the best we could. We left you good information, but you got to study the information. Before the Mayflower by Dr. Lerone Bennett, right? Best book written on African-American history in one volume. There's much, much more, but his is so classic. So I never got that one. I never got that one, Professor. Yeah, you got to get this one. I okay. knew Dr. Bennett. We worked together out in Chicago on the reparations movement for years. He's oh, an ancestor now, but an extraordinary historian. Loved his people. And this is a good book. The Origin of Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkinson. Now, it's about caste. Because in America, it's not just about race. It's about caste. There's a class of white elite families who have formed the caste, and they don't want nobody challenging their power. Mm. So we need to read that book. And of course, you know, our main man, Dr. Claude Anderson, he lays out in Powernomics how you can get your economic shit together and how you can organize to do it. And then we got our little sister. Now, everybody don't have to agree with her, but she's out there trying, and that's Sister Tamika Mallory, you know? And she, her document is called The State of Emergency. Now, Tamika got some good concepts and ideas in here that we need to get into and learn. And then there's another OG. I tell everybody, read this book. It's called Plural But Equal, Blacks and Minorities in America, Plural Society. And what the book is about is an analysis of the NACP and all those other organizations. Even back then, he was making some of the same points by the risks that you're making now. Mm. Dr. Harold Cruz, Plural But Equal. Mm -hmm. And then you have to lead, read the life. We talk about Malcolm or sometimes we forget the queen. Right? Betty Shabazz. Betty Shabazz. And the queen got a lot to say. She helped teach me. This is one of my teachers right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll learn a lot. And then there's the young master and the old master. 
and this is by Sister Dr. Dietina Wright, Booker T. Washington, the Pan-Africanist. You read this little book and you're going to get shocked and go, oh, shit, I didn't know all of that. Mm. I've been played, really played. So mm. get this book, Booker mm -hmm. T. Washington and Africa, The Making of a Pan-Africanist. Mm -hmm. And you will find that we've been given a, a bunch of crock of lies. Then there's the last one. It's called Sheroes of the Haitian Revolution. Whew. And and this is my favorite right here. So it's, 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 she's just fine from the painting they put up of her. <laughs> Cecile Fatima. That's Sister Cecile Fatima is one of the women who led that a meeting at uh Guacaman, that island, when Bookman's prayer was said. It was the women who called the meeting, and they're the one put the men in charge. Okay. But these women fought in the army. Some of them became generals. And we need to learn about them. There's one sister in particular. Let me see if I can find her. And, and um, they captured her husband. Did they, did they capture her husband? And then when she rose up, not Marie Louise, no. With all, there's so many bad sisters in Haiti. Marie Jean. Oh, you've got to study Marie Jean. Mm. Learn about this lady. Learn about this warrior lady, this warrior queen down in Haiti. You know, and that's another thing. We got to do more to help our people in Haiti. We, 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 I just saw a thing the other day where Trinidad turned back a plane uh, with a lot of Haitians that came in and they're going to put them back on the plane. How do you call yourself an African nation? and your people come to you in dire straits, and you're gonna send them back into the dire strait. Haiti is one of the richest countries in the hemisphere, but the wealth of Haiti is being stolen by the Americans, the Israelis, the Canadians, and the French. And we don't even know what's going on down there. The Haiti has an oil reserve off of its coast, bigger than the oil reserve off of Venezuela. If they just tap and mine the Haiti oil, every person in Haiti would make a million dollars a year and never be a poverty in the land, but they won't. America won't let Haiti drill for its own oil. Haiti's mm. got gold and Haiti's got diamond, but the Israelis and the Canadians and the others are in those mountains mining those diamonds. And then ha Haiti's got, what is it called, uridium? Um, you know, the, the, the meteorite that falls from the sky? Yeah, yeah, I think it's ir iridium, like you said. Iridium. Yeah. Right. yeah. One of the, the, the most expensive metals in the world. Haiti's mm. got more of it than any other place in the world. Mm. And they're down there mining it and stealing it and then telling us how poor Haiti is because they murder every leader that comes, just like the Americans murdered the past president, you know? And they've got a mafia down there they call the oligarchs <clears throat> ruling things for them. Mm -hmm. So we need to help our people, but we need to learn the truth. Reading a book like this one by Sister Bayuna Bello on the sheroes of the Haitian Revolution, you will be surprised and you see when that movie Viola was in about women's queen, that ain't no joke. Those women that went to Haiti, guess where they came from? Most of them came from Dahomey. The French captured much of that army and sold them into Haiti. And they fostered the damn revolution. The women mm. were behind the revolution. Mm. Wow. Let's get to... Uh, yeah. Let's get There's to... a sister named Ezele Dantor. She mm. has the Free Haiti... Her, her channel is the Free Haiti Movement. So you only mm. need to look that up. She'll give you the information. But there's okay. a lady, ain't no joke now. <laughs> straight up, straight ahead, a disruptor. We we gonna get to uh, let's get to some questions. We're gonna do a, about two questions before we get out of here, Professor. Mm -hmm. First one is from Kelly. What does Professor Small recommend black women do to support black men? The same thing I'll tell black men to do to support black women. First respect her as an African queen, respect him as a king and make him live up to it. Respect her as a queen and make her live up to it. How do you do that? Study your history, study your culture, study your grandmama, study your great grandparents. See, because it's knowing thyself, self-worth, self-value, self-interest and self-esteem all come from having, being shackled to your identity. What is that identity? Don't be afraid to learn about Africa. They're not they. We all came from Africa to here. Whether we came before the slave boat, or came after the slave boat, or on the slave boat, we all came from Africa. That's where it all began. 
So let's study Africa and find out what is it that is the best way to approach respecting one another, having true knowledge of the history that has put us into the contradiction that we have to where we now hate one another. The black men, we mad with the black woman, not because of what the white man was able to do to the black woman. We mad with the black woman because we mad with ourselves that we couldn't protect the black woman. Mm. See, we mad about that. But instead of being mad at ourselves and not being able to protect her, we mad at her said, because she allowed herself to be abused. She didn't allow herself to be abused. She got abused because we didn't kill the damn abuser and died if we had to. Some of us did, but too many of us didn't. And even now, that same abuser is still there. They're abusing us psychologically. They're abusing us intellectually. They're abusing us culturally. They're abusing us socially. And the black man needs to stand up. If that black woman is your queen, treat her like she's the queen. African culture says the black woman is the power and the man is the authority. Authority only becomes authority because that's given to it by the power. So the black woman has to learn how to be the power. That means you know what the reality and the truth is. And the black man has to learn how to be the authority to receive the authority from the power to protect the black family. And so the processes on how to be a family is what we have to study. Because there's no black world without the black woman and the black man coming together. Right. There, there's no black world. And if you ever watch what they do on the TV now, every damn commercial has got a mixed marriage. You never see a black man with a black woman in a commercial anymore. You never see a black woman with a black man in commercial. Most of the commercial, 90% of it, they have us with somebody from the European uh, community. You think that's an accident? You think they're just giving us some jobs and commercials now? Hmm. That's propaganda. That's mind control. The other thing they got on is black men in gay commercials kissing each other. You think that's accidental? Okay. They're playing a mind control game on you because they know if I can't murder that black family, I can't stop the opposition. And so black woman, what you have to do is be the best goddess the world mm. have ever seen. Mm. And then you can demand of that black man and be straight up. If you think you're going to crawl between these pillows of heaven, <laughs> not being worthy of coming into that space, you got the wrong queen, brother. Woo. The brother got to be worthy. The brother got to be worthy, huh? Got to be worthy because uh. she got the power. You hear him, Kelly. You hear him, Kelly. Let's get to the next question. Darlene wants to know, Brother Rich, can you ask Baba what was his most memorable moment with Malcolm X? Well, see, that's a beautiful question because I only met him one time. Mm -hmm. And that's my memorable moment. Let me tell you mm -hmm. about that meeting. I saw him on television. And I'm in South Carolina at the time. Mm -hmm. My mother and my father was very active. My whole family, I'm a small. We come out of a war footing. We're Bush Negroes. The, you know, they call us the Freewood N-word back in the day because we grew up, we were, we're maroon people, right? Mm, okay. But we didn't use the term maroon over here. They call it the Freewood niggas, okay? That's who we were. That's who the smalls were. And so I came out of that. Fighting for our race was the way of life. I grew up in the woods in an African village in the country by a river where people still carry stuff on their head. We spoke Gullah Geechee. I still can't write English. I don't know a thing about English grammar, right? Because I still think in my language, right? And so when I saw this man on television in 1962, he just blew me away. So my mom and dad had moved to New York to try to find better work to make money. And we were living with our grandparents. So I called my mother and told her, I want to meet this man. So she had my big brother drive me to New York. And I went to the temple on 116th Street. And the brothers told me, me and brother Dwight Green were together. And they told us Malcolm was on 141st Street. And I remember the Food Family Supermarket and 8th Avenue. Went down there as a 16-year-old, scared out of my life. 
And I met this tall, light skin. He was lighter than I thought he was. Gentle giant who just took me and Dwight and just gave us a conversation about what? Education and how education was going to help us win our revolution. Because I was talking about leaving school. I wanted to come and fight with him. And he, he said, no, young brother, you need to go back to school and finish. Then you need to go on to college and learn what you need to learn in order to teach it to our people. And he talked to us for about 15 minutes. He was passing out flyers with a bunch of brothers there against the march on Washington, a march which my mother went on, by the way, back in the day. And I never saw him again. I went back down south. I thought I was Malcolm X. I started acting like the crazy militant. Next thing I know, the white folks had me shovel off to the military the day after graduation. And he got killed while I was overseas in France. We had heard he was coming to, wow. to Paris. And so we were stationed in Cannes. And so about five of us went over to Paris to see him, but he never came. And we didn't know why. So we went back to Cannes and we hung out, having fun like young men do at 20 years old and playing on the beaches and stuff. And we went out to sea. And we were out to sea about, I guess, three weeks when we got mail call, three or four weeks, we got mail call. And I had a big packet because my brother was with him in the OAAU. And the packet was from my brother. And when I opened the packet, it was the news clippings of his assassination. Mm. And so, and this is my first encounter with CID, the Central Intelligence Division of the U.S. Navy. I took the all of the clippings my brother sent mm -hmm. and I made a big photo album. And I'm trying to teach the little bit I can about Malcolm X, knowing the autobiography was not yet. Um, and two days after I started showing this around, the CID raided my locker and took that document. I wasn't there. I was told who did it. They claimed they never did it. But it showed up in a court situation with me and Malcolm's nephew, Rodnell, five years later in Boston, Massachusetts, when they used that. And I was testifying for Roddy in a situation. And they brought this big packet in. I go, look, on me. Information I was a foot high, right? And they told the judge, there's nothing this man got to say that is worth believing. And they were oh. talking about me. I'm looking like scratching my head and one of the items they had was that portfolio album that they had taken out of my lock in the navy years earlier and so when malcolm got killed and i got home months later i went to his sister i joined the organization i asked the mosque had closed most of the brothers had went into hiding a few brothers had remained it was about 10 brothers that were still there and I began to recruit uh, Vietnam vets because I wanted an army. And then I got this army and I realized the army needs some moral foundation. So I asked for the mosque to be open and I got elected. I didn't even run, I didn't want to. When they first elected me, I turned it down. And they had another week of interviewing and so forth and another election. And I got elected a second time. I was gonna turn it down again when Haji Sham the brother who buried Malcolm, tell me to walk with him around the block. That was a walk around the block I should have never taken. <laughs> and when we walk around the block, Haji says, listen, Ella said, this is Malcolm's sister. If you take this for one year and just help us out here, because we trust you and we get a chance to train somebody else. And I agreed to that. Well, mm -hmm. One year became something close to 18 years. Wow. And that's how I got in the midst of all of that. Beautiful story, man. Wow. Let's uh get to thanks for that question, Darlene Moore. Let's uh get to one last. We're gonna do one last question before we get out of here, family. Uh, we done had the professor on here for about an hour and a half. Shout out to Chan Robinson gave a hundred dollar super chat donation. Chan wants to know what book would you recommend we read for the current time we're in? He just gave a book list, Chan. Yeah, uh, now will, will that book list be? I mean, one piece I would like, I think that everybody should read, Chan. Well, it's really two. And this one is the polynomics piece mm. because the economic piece is essential for you young folks because you're making more money than any generation of Blacks has ever made in the history of America. 
but you have to learn how to manage and invest and control that capital. Mm -hmm. So polynomics should be an absolute read for that. And the other would be plural but equal because you want to, like we would, we started out talking about the NACP. Mm -hmm. We want to really understand what mistakes that generation made. Mm -hmm. Who were the organizations during that period of time? And Dr. Cruz really laid that out in here, right? And then the, the other one that I was talking about, where is um, the Mayflower? Because if you don't know your history, you're caught in somebody else's mystery. Before the Mayflower, history of Black America. The 1619 Project is a good idea, but I don't know whether that's really all ours. They get so, oh, the sister came up with yada, 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 I'm falling for that shit. Right? <laughs> because we were here before 1619. Uh -huh. And the people who came on that ship in 1619, none of them were enslaved. That ship, who was the Dutch ship that came in because they ran out of food and everything and they sold those black folks to the white people who gave them supplies for their ships so they could keep going. And all of those people were indentured and worked their way out of the indentured debt to the whites, all died free people, uh -huh. right? Many of them married Native American women, some of them married white women, poor white women who would come over as indentured servants from Europe. But none of, they were not enslaved. That's not when slavery started in America. And then you had to go back to find out Sir Walter Wally was here decades earlier. Got stuck in Raleigh, North Carolina. That's why it's called Raleigh, right? And he had about 200 black folks with him. But they ran out of food. And them fools didn't know how to plan a hunt. Right? So, hmm. Are you going to be in the woods in America and get hungry? Does that make any sense? <laughs> That's how y'all poor they were. Stupid they were. So they dumped the 200 black people and left our asses here. And he took most of the white people. A few whites stayed back too. They made it to England because they had to eat their dead in mm. the last few weeks. Mm -mm -mm. So we need to, why don't they put that history out there? That's before 1619. Mm -hmm. Then go back to 1527. The Spanish came up here from the Dominican Republic to South Carolina, South Carolina today, right at Winyard Bay, where I was born. And the black folks, 300 or so of them, burned two of the Spanish ship, and one got away and took the leaders back to the Dominican Republic, and the rest of the black folks ran free. Mm -hmm. So all the black folks down there married into the native people that was there. But now who was the native people? The native people that was there was them black folks who came on the ships from Mali. Mansa Musa may have gone up there and made everybody rich, but when he comes back down, was it him or his son? He brought almost a thousand shiploads of people over here. Never went back to Africa. I heard about that. So the way you want to follow that out, there's a good book, David M. Hotep, The First Americans Were Africa. When the Asiatic, who we call the Indian, got, came here, they met us here. And that's why they, some of them became red. Some of them still are Asiatic. But some became red because when the yellow and the black makes you get red. So we need to study the history. Ivan Van Sediment, they came before Columbus. If you read um, Young Chase, uh, you know Brother Chase? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He's got a book out that he, the way he looked at 19 of the so-called white explorers who wrote in their diaries and their records that they met black people here when they got here. So we was here before the slave ship, okay? Oh. And the ones who was here before the slave ship married into the ones who came off the slave ships. You understand? Mm -hmm. And so we all became one amalgamation. And so we need to get all us arson. Oh, my wife coming too loud. <laughs> <laughs> we so about the finish count. Yeah, we're about to wrap it up. Listen, Professor, we're about to wrap it up. Let me put your information on the screen one last time. Uh, this book, I want to get this book. Laron breaks down our history for you. And then always look at the bibliography when you buy a book. And you'll get another 50 or 60 good books to, to study from. That's facts. That is facts, Professor. Hit up Professor's Cash App, PayPal. Once again, Professor James Small, I want to thank you for coming on here. I learned so much as One I always book. do. Yeah. One more book, Rich. I'm sorry, my brother. I'm always cutting you off. It's called Rebirthing African Consciousness. Rebirthing African, African Consciousness. Consciousness. I can't remember the author's name. It's a mile long, a young 
brother Youngblood, but your age out of Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But the book is a must read, mm -hmm. Rebirthing African Consciousness. You can get it on Amazon, just throw the title up there. And they may try to outprice you, but when they put them high price on the black books, just keep going back and the prices come down. Oh, that's that's a trick, huh? Yeah, or ask for a used copy. Mm -hmm. Most used copy is fairly brand new. Indeed, uh, indeed. And you get a better price. Thank you to everybody for tuning in tonight. This was a real good one tonight, y'all. Y'all gonna have to rewatch this one again. Professor James Small, keep doing what you're doing, my brother. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you as always. Love and light. Love you much. Stay strong. Straight ahead. It's your revolution. It's your time. Make the African world y'all want to see. Mm. Your generation's duty. Thank you, my brother. See you next time. Peace, family. Peace.